It seems to me in every life uh, there is a seemingly established trajectory uh, which may be modified by seminal events in one's life. And for me, it seemed to me there have been four. One, my decision to go into Madison. Two, my good fortune in meeting the woman I married. Three, the gift of children. And fourth was my improbable encounter with marijuana. I was moving from a position of believing that this was a very destructive, harmful drug to ending up all these years later uh, believing that it's really a blessing. In the 1960s, I was very busy and I had little time to pay attention to all the interesting things that were going on at that time. But as I looked out of my academic window, I saw all these young people using this terribly dangerous drug. There was also a personal reason I was concerned about that harmfulness, and that was that uh, my closest friend was Carl Sagan. He smoked it uh, and had been smoking it uh, for some time. And I would say to him, look, Carl, this is, this is harmful stuff. You're, you're going to uh, jeopardize your health if you continue to do this. He would say, Lester, here, have a puff. It's perfectly harmless. <laughs> I decided, well, you know, what is the data upon which I'm so authoritatively saying it's a very harmful drug? I decided to go into the Harvard Library and look for the scientific and medical basis of this prohibition, which I was certain I would find. I discovered that, uh, that I was 180 degrees off. It wasn't, uh, you know, a narrow view by me. It was the position that was promoted by the federal government. A couple of publishers, book publishers, asked me to uh, write a book on the subject. There were two reasons I decided to do it. One, uh, because I was so fascinated by my, early, my earlier explorations of this drug. And two, when I was working on it earlier, my son, uh, who was then 10 years old, Danny, it's the first time he expressed any interest in my work. It was July 4th, 67, he came home from the fireworks and it was clear he was sick. He was diagnosed with acute lymphocytic leukemia. And I thought uh, uh, I would do the book if I could get it out in time for him to see it. His therapy went very well for the first couple of years. But then he started to uh, have to get chemotherapeutics, which lead to a lot of nausea and vomiting. It's a nausea which goes right down to your toenails. He'd get in the car and the race was to get him home before he started to vomit, and then he was in his bed with a bucket by the side of the bed. And it got to the point he had such anticipatory anxiety about just going in for those sessions. It was about this time that Betsy and I were invited to dinner uh, at a, a friend's house who was hosting Dr. Fry. At that dinner, he was familiar with Marijuana Reconsidered. He did read the chapter on medicine. He said, uh, having read that, I want to ask you a question, Dr. Brinsman. I had a young man in Houston who was 17 years old, who when he started to get the chemotherapeutics that lead to this kind of awful nausea and vomiting, he seriously threatened not to continue with it. One day he came in and just hopped up on the gurney, got the injection, by gents, he said, and he left. A couple of weeks later, same thing happened. And Dr. Fry said, hey, Jimmy, what's, what's this? You seem so different in your attitude towards getting this drug. And he said, well, I'll tell you. 20 minutes before I came in last time and this time, I had part of a joint out in my car, and that's what's done it. He said to me, Dr. Grinspoon, do you think that that's a credible story? And I said, well, the 19th century experience 
uh, certainly suggested it was an anti-nauseant. Now, on the way home, Betsy in the car asked me, she said, Lester, don't you think we ought to get a small amount of marijuana for Danny? And I can't believe I said this, but I did. I said, uh, no, we can't do that because it's illegal. And also, we do not want to in any way embarrass the uh, people at the Jimmy Fund building who are taking such good care of him. And I dismissed it. The next time he had uh, his appointment for treatment, I would walk over and meet them. And I was prepared that he was going to have a lot of anxiety and discomfort in his face, and that would be mirrored in her expression, and soon I would be the same place. And instead, I found them joking. And finally I said, hey, what's going on here? I'm missing out on something. They teased me a little bit, but finally they told me that Betsy had, on the way to the hospital, had driven up to the Wellesley High School parking lot and asked his friend Mark, could he get her a little bit of marijuana? And once Mark recovered from his disbelief that Mrs. Grinspoon was asking him for some marijuana, uh, he ran off and within 10 minutes he was back and he had uh, a joint. Then they drove into the children's hospital. Danny smoked, had a few puffs of it, just a few puffs. He got up on the gurney, he had the medicine, and when he got off the gurney, he said, uh, hey mom, I noticed there's a sub shop on Brookline Avenue. Could we stop and get a sub on the way home? It was impossible, almost impossible to believe. And from that time on, we never had to deal with the nausea and vomiting of cancer chemotherapy, which was the thing he feared most. It was a real uh, fortuitously uh, marvelous event. And the Betsy had the stuff to go up <laughs> and do what she did. Danny did get the book in time to see it. Uh, that's about all I can say about it.